Welcome everyone, especially our visitors to this online gathering of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Bowling Green. My name is Christina Kruger and I will be your service associates today on this beautiful yet cloudy day. I hope everybody has made it through the time change as well, even we may be feeling a little bit groggy, but we made it through. We are a welcoming congregation. Whoever you are, however you identify, Wherever you come from and whoever you love, you are welcome here. Our Sunday services are different each week so that we can honor and learn from our wet, right, wide array of traditions and beliefs. Today, our speaker is Jane Olmsted. Jane Olmsted is a professor of English at Western Kentucky University. Her collection of poetry, Seeking the Other Side, was published in 2015, and her memoir, The Tree You Come Home To, is forthcoming this fall. Jane and her husband, Ken, raised three boys in Bowling Green. The youngest was shot and killed in 2009. That loss is the subject of her both books. She and Ken are now raising her son's daughter. Another granddaughter lives in Louisville. They live in the country with three bird, dogs, two cats, several fish, and many, many birds. And today's topic, it is things we lo lo love and lose, things we love and keep. Though we each walk our own path here in this place and now at this time, we join together as one community. This morning, Cassidy Kruger will be given our opening reading. Intricate and untraceable, weaving and interweaving, dark strand with light. Designed beyond all spiderly contrivance to link, not to entrap. Elation, grief, joy, contrition entwined. Shaking, changing, forever forming, transforming. All praise, all praise to the great web. For the worldwide community of Unitarian Universalists, the flaming chalice is the symbol of the light of learning, the fire of our commitment, and the love within our congregation. As our congregation's chalice is lit, you're welcome to join in and sing in hymn number 362, Rise Up, O Flame. Join us as we sing number 38, Morning Has Broken. Oh, 
We will now have a few moments for meditation, reflection, and prayer. And also at this time, we would like to honor the fact this is the one year anniversary of the pandemic. So I would like to honor those who we've lost this past year, those who are still in the hospital for the long term, those in isolation, our healthcare workers and essential workers, and those who are still suffering through this pandemic. The singing bowl will lead us now into silence. As mentioned earlier, Unitarian Universalists have a wide array of beliefs, and the speakers at our Sunday services come from many traditions. Here to share her own thoughts today is Jane Olmsted. Hi there. I am delighted to be with you this uh, today uh, sharing some poetry in recognition of Women's History Month. So before I begin, I need to do a little business here and uh, share my screen. So let me do that. And let me go ahead and start the presentation. So I call the presentation Things We Love and Lose, Things We Love and Keep. And in it, I share poems, uh, both my own and other uh, poets, and uh, on this theme. And I've looked for poems that uh, address the theme in kind of unexpected ways, or at least not what you'd expect judging from this moving image of chocolates. <laughs> but um, when I, and when I've chosen, um, poets who are well known, I've tried to select uh, some of the, uh, one of their poems that is, is less well known. And I've tried to explore this from, a, a, like I said, an unexpected way, um, looking at things we love that we don't always think about um, initially. So uh, the poems, the slides uh, actually show the poems. And um, for myself, I sometimes find it easier to read uh, while I listen, uh, so I can actually see how the poem appears on the page. Uh, I'm not, uh, for the most part, illustrating the, the poems with images. Um, 
that seems kind of trite, uh, but I, and I also don't interpret the poems very much, but I have tried to organize them in a way that they, you know, sort of speak to each other or pick up on themes or issues uh, from, the, from the previous poem. So the first two poems uh, are about uh, people that we want to be around and also people that we'd like to be. And so this first one is called To Be of Use by Marge Piercy. The people I love the best jump into work head first without dallying in the shallows and swim off with sure strokes almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, the black sleek heads of seals bouncing like half submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves an ax to a heavy cart who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in where the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud, botched, it appear, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust, but the thing worth doing well has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know they were made to be used. The, pic the pitcher cries for water to carry, and a person for work that is real. And uh, this one is called uh, Famous by Naomi Shihab Nye. And uh, it, she uses the word famous really interestingly, I think. The river is famous to the fish. The loud voice is famous to silence, which knew it would inherit the earth before anybody said so. The cat sleeping on the fence is famous to the birds watching him from the birdhouse. The tear is famous briefly to the cheek. The idea you carry close to your bosom is famous to your bosom. The boot is famous to the earth, more famous than the dress shoe, which is famous only to floors. The bent photograph is famous to the one who carries it and not at all famous to the one who is picture pictured. I want to be famous to shuffling men who smile while crossing streets, sticky children in grocery lines, famous as the one who smiled back. I want to be famous in the way a pulley is famous or a buttonhole, not because it did anything spectacular, but because it never forgot what it could do. This is a different kind of love story, uh, Learning to Love America by Shirley Gocklin Lim because it has no pure products, because the Pacific Ocean sweeps along the coastline, because the water of the ocean is cold and because land is better than ocean, because I say we rather than they. Because I live in California, I have eaten fresh artichokes and jacaranda bloom in April and May. Because my senses have caught up with my body, my breath with the air it swallows, my hunger with my mouth, because I walk barefoot in my house, because I have nursed my son at my breast, because he is a strong American boy, because I have seen his eyes redden when he is asked who he is, because he answers, I don't know. Because to have a son is to have a country, because my son will bury me here, because countries are in our blood and we bleed them, because it is late, and too late to change my mind because it is time. So the next one is one of mine, um, sort of on the theme of con uh, countries. Uh, this is um, uh, was um, written or um, inspired by a trip that my husband and I took uh, to Lithuania for a conference. And it's called Far, Far Away in Vilnius. A paper boat and an empty carton of juice dangled from a bridge over the river. Why, you asked, did someone do that? I said, 
Two children were playing in the water with boats they had made, and afterwards they hung them out to dry. Then in the river, we saw a stack of shapely rocks, then another, then many. They looked dribbled from the sky, dabbles of brown paint. Why are the rocks piled just so, you asked, why? In the city of churches, I said, pagans come to the water, gripping the slick stones with their toes, then hoisting them high. Not only that, I say, here in the side streets of Vilnius, doorways too small to step through, unless you're an elf or a child or an old couple stooped over. I miss my home, I tell you, which is why I'm sad. Is it a big missing, you ask? No, it's a little one, like a notch on one of these padlocks attached to this bridge by people in love. We lift and turn them and they settle with a clink above the water. And then I ask if you have a lock for us, knowing you don't, are just discovering them like that on the way to someplace else. Um, and this next one is a kind of a poem away from home. Uh, and it was written, inspired and started <laughs> on a solo camping trip in Colorado. And at the, at the high end of this hike that was quite strenuous, um, I came upon this beautiful mountain lake, you know, clear uh, blue green water and stretched across the, this pond, alpine, pond or lake was a narrow aspen tree that had fallen and uh, crossed the, uh, the, the pond. When I fall, when I fall, I'd like it to be in a very clear lake at the top of a mountain. I'd like to know that I will see the mounting fuzz of moss and beneath the hard calcium of other elements that fishes start beneath me in the sun and above the brilliant stars pulse in harmony. I'd like to fall with a splash and ripples that hit the shores and come back to me saying, yes, it's there. When I fall, I'd like to know it's near home, that my roots, even exposed, are familiar, if not exactly what they were before. Make it green, a hint of blue, and me, bleached of all color, just a path, narrow and tentative, for some tiny creature seeking the other side. So also on the theme of home, um, this beautiful poem by Margaret Walker called Sorrow Home. My roots are deep in Southern life, deeper than John Brown or Nat Turner or Robert Lee. I was sired and weaned in a tropic world the palm tree and banana leaf, mango and coconut, breadfruit and rubber trees know me. Warm skies and gulf blue streams are in my blood. I belong with a smell of fresh pine with a trail of coon and the spring growth of wild onion. I am no hothouse bulb to be reared in steam heated flats with the music of L and subway in my ears, walled in by steel and wood and brick far from the sky. I want the cotton fields, tobacco and the cane. I want to walk along with sacks of seeds to drop in fallow ground. Restless music is in my heart and I am eager to be gone. Oh Southland, sorrow home, melody beating in my bone and blood. How long will the clan of hate, the hounds and the chain gangs keep me from my own? And to recognize that our love of home also includes the people, there's this one by Lucille Clifton called Sisters. Me and you be sisters, we be the same. Me and you coming from the same place. Me and you be greasing our legs, touching up our edges. Me and you be scared of rats, be stepping on roaches. Me and you come running high down Purdy Street one time and mama laugh and shake her head at me and you. Me and you got babies, got 35, got black. Let our hair go back. Be loving ourselves, be loving ourselves, be sisters. Only where you sing, I poet. Okay, so um, my um, family's 
most uh, shocking experience with things we love and lose was the death of our youngest son in uh, 2009. And uh, he was shot and killed by a Kentucky man from Rockfield. So the poems I'm reading today are from this collection. Um, you will notice, perhaps some of you recognize that um, the artwork on the cover is um, a painting, an image of a painting by Ivan Pekas, a WKU a painting professor and uh, called Braced. And I was thrilled that she, um, she wanted her, her cover, one of her paintings to be put on the cover and I just love it. And so my second one also on the same theme uh, is a memoir and it's coming out this fall. And this time the artwork is by my son Galen and it'll be called The Tree You Come Home To. So uh, this first poem, um, I'll, read, uh, I'll read several um, from that collection. It's called Gazal by a Thread. And as you'll notice, this is a poem that's done in couplets. And you'll also notice that the first two lines end with the same word and that that word then gets repeated in the second line of each of the subsequent couplets. So that's part of the form. Um, I, I probably butchered the form in other ways, but it, it is a love poem, usually a romantic love poem. Gazal by a thread. <clears throat> love is a thread that will not break, though in this gray life it surely must, bearing as it does so much yours, theirs, my life. Last night I walked a star crazed night, then sat on the old swing until the bare branches glittered, morse coating a splintered life. In utter stillness sometimes I hear a whispering, things not living, spirits piercing the plane that separates us, though not you, silent from life. So new to their world, are you seeking a way through some breach? I search the edge of every odd shaped thing, scrap of life and ask, what on earth is the matter? What does it mean to be the thing that ended next to you? What difference are you to your own life? The silhouette I've made for myself, chalking up scorn for this or that is blurring and the lines redrawing. It seems the life I've called my own is but an echo of someone else, someone who can only be heard or found if she lets go of that life, sloughing off the skin and bearing the rawness, pulling hand over hand and gathering the lines of this deep shadowed life. <coughs> Excuse me. So this next uh, poem uh, is um, calls to mind what happens when we lose someone we love, and that is that we often think we see them. Um, we may hear a laugh that reminds them of this person, or we might see them driving by or think we do, or someone walking off in the distance in a crowd. So I call it minor chord. <clears throat> if I could write a minor chord, it would begin with a gesture I know well, a nod or touch, a particular lilt in the gait, the manner of shoulders held just so, and then the nod would be too bright, the touch a little heavier than quite right, the familiar lope would catch like a fingernail between the thirds and fifths, and shoulders that carry their weight with a soft apology would stride too widely off the campus and pull the colors to the side. If I could sing or paint a wounded child, the eyes upward appeal would sound a wail and the bloodied brow still seep though it's hours since I put the brushes away. Voices would creep through the muted landscape like a conversation from another room and the rocky ledge where God might reach a hand crumble and begin to slip away. The moment would rise up when corded muscles mutate and the song in the throat find passage in the haunted field where winter flowers clamor for the sun. And here's a different sort of love poem. Um, she told me the earth loves us by Anne Haven MacDonald. <clears throat> she said it softly without a need for conviction or romance. 
After everything, I asked, ashamed. That's not the kind of love she meant. She walked through a field of gray, beetleboard pine, snags branching like polished bone. I forget sometimes how trees look at me with the generosity of water. I forget all the other breath I'm breathing in. Today, I learned that trees can't sleep with our lights on, that they knit a forest in their language, their feelings. This is not a metaphor. Like seeing a face across a crowd, we are learning all the old things, newly shined and numbered. I'm always looking for a place to lie down and cry. Green, mossed, shaded, or rock quiet, empty, somewhere to hush and start over. I put on my antlers in the sun. I walk through the dark gates of the trees. Grief waters my footsteps, leaving a trail that glistens. And um, no collection of love poetry would be complete without a love poem about our bodies. So this is by Joy Layton, Letter to My Body. Philosophers shilly shally, but it's true. You are me, I am you. This dust, these rays, this strange internal sense that after all these years, I finally exist. All of this is only mine through you. You still seem surprised, that's part of your charm, that I wish to be extracted from your handsome bindings. This, you say, is only the beginning, which is why it feels like drowning in what we've both survived. Ever the politician, I say, I'll be your widow, smiling cheerfully as you die. Not yet, you say, as though this is the other part of your charm. You still believe in time. Violent laughter, yours and mine. Let's go out into the woods of meaning and matter among the laurels and the mustard, the unlit suns and unnamed branches, listening shoots and loosening leaves we only appreciate when we're drowning in one another. Let's break up before we meet and fall in love again in the darkening parlor of your heart. Let's wait for God in the gathering dusk and watch the stars come out. This is a poem, title poem of the memoir and one of the poems in the collection. It's called The Tree You Come Home To. In the story I used to read to you about the runaway bunny, Mother Rabbit is always the very thing it takes to bring her bunny home. A picture hangs in a poster frame on your wall. If you become a bird and fly away from me, I'll be the tree you come home to. Now that you have said, I will die and leave this earth and you behind, Mother Rabbit just wags her carrot, and I don't know what shape I can pour myself into that can possibly bring you home. Shall I become a wisp of light and scent so you will recognize the angel who embraces you? If I become the place where your shadow feet can still leave an impression, would you know me as the path you take to find yourself at God's feet? Beside the shivers of worm trails and carcasses of insects, I reach inside and grasp the place that weeps. So you will know, in the way that spirits know, the weight is yours, is mine. And this one is um, the last section of a seven part poem um, inspired by this uh, bristlecone pine, which I saw on that Colorado trip. And it's also um, inspired by Johannes Brahms Requiem. Um, the, each of the sections picks up language from the Requiem and it also um, tries to pick up some of the mood uh, and tone of each of those sections. So part seven. Blessed, it's, it is said, are the dead. Already your torments have lost their sting and your good works follow you. We speak of being better people and set our timid feet upon the ground. I begin to see that when peace enters, its succor will not pervade, that nothing will stay the loss of you except you in your new form, moving and yet still. I pull you close the way I always pulled you close and note again the sweetness and despair that made you wise beyond your years. We gave and took, you and I, and evermore, I fill my hands and lift them to you. Drink, then let us go. 
And because I don't want to leave things sad, I'll share this one by uh, the much loved Mary Oliver. Hello, people. I'm going to read one poem from my new book, Dog Songs. And it's called Little Dog's Rhapsody in the Night. He puts his cheek against mine and makes small expressive sounds. And when I'm awake or awake enough, he turns upside down, his four paws in the air, and his eyes dark and fervent. Tell me you love me. He says, tell me again, could there be a sweeter arrangement over and over? He gets to ask, I get to tell. Thank you. That's such a good poem. And I wanted to close with something that sums it all up. And so I offer this one. Birds Still Build Nests by Mary Carol Hackett. Even when bombs are falling, even when the dams are failing, even when the hate is ravenous and roaring, even when the hills are on fire, birds still build nests, making homes for their babies, weaving string and straw and song and wire into being, as if the world is not careening toward ending, as if they've forgotten how dark how dark it always is. But then maybe we're the ones who have forgotten, who have made myths of our own pain, who have convinced ourselves of power against the torrential rain, all wishful shields and shrouds sown of things that don't last, can't last. The birds skittering between forever and yesterday say, nothing lasts, build it anyway. So thank you for listening. I've got a couple of slides here of the sources. Um, I'll leave those a couple seconds each. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, for sharing your thoughts with us today on this meaningful topic. As part of our reasonable, responsible search for truth and meaning, we encourage the thoughtful discourse, and so you're invited to stay in the Zoom meeting after the service in and join in the sermon discussion breakout room. We also have a time for sharing our joys and concerns and for socializing in another breakout room. If you have questions about Unitarian Universalism or about joining this congregation, please contact our board president, Richard Thornton, by email lakenhealth64 at gmail.com. If you'd like to receive our weekly email update or our monthly newsletter, please type your email address into the chat box or email us at office at uubgky.org. Our community is strengthened by sharing our resources. This place and the work we do is supported by the voluntary generosity of all those who contribute. The offerment is a sacrament of the free church. The offering will now be given and received in a grateful appreciation of our shared hopes and values. While we listen to the offertory of music, we invite you to go to the website shown on the screen and donate there, or to write a check and prepare it for mailing.
We thank you for your generous gifts. May we use them wisely in the service of our congregation and in our community. Our closing reading today comes from the late great Maya Angelou. The ache for home lives in all of us, the safe place where we can go as we are and not be questioned. We will now sing Love Will Guide Us. We will extinguish the flame in our chalice, but not the light of truth or the warmth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. This we'll carry in our hearts wherever we go. Go in peace, go in service to others, go in love. Amen. Namaste, and so mote it be.